Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, This is part of the Skubani e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Skubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Today, I have a David Wolf. He's founder of Merchandise Mecca for almost nine years, and he specializes in selling vacuum parts, coffee filters, and all the sexy stuff like air, air filtration. David, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. I do a lot of research on people, and you really fly under the radar. I can't find anything besides just a few things. So I'm really looking forward to digging in to what works, what doesn't work, what's worked for you. And um, to start off, what's a must for sellers to boost sales when people ask your advice? Well, you got to have good product. And you got to have good relationships with your suppliers. Uh, you have to know a little bit about um, how to operate some of the programs to sell. And you just got to work hard. What are some of the best questions? Do, do people, I mean, do you have a network of people that you turn to with, like in the e-commerce world? I have a couple people that I talk to. Mm-hmm. I had a, a friend of mine who has owned a, actually a vacuum, central vacuum cleaner website for 15 years. Mm-hmm. And he's the one that I kind of got interested in selling online from. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I would throw things by him, and uh, he didn't really much care about uh, me competing against him. So he just That's any question, he answered it, and that really helped get me started. Yeah. What good advice did he give you early on when you were getting, well, getting started? Well, the, the best advice is that content is king. Hmm. So when you s- try to sell something, you can't just throw out a one sentence um, description and expect people to buy it and. So it's pictures and descriptions are critical, and price, believe it or not, is much lower on the list. Mm, really? So do you do certain things to build a really good description? What kind of components go into that for you? Well, I'll, I get the, I order everything. I don't put stuff online before I actually have it in stock. Mm. So I bring it in. I take it out of the package. I, I see what kind of quality it is. I really try to sell stuff that's not going to come back. So I want quality products here at all times. And then I look at what the manufacturer has put on the package to see, you know, and I'll use that. I'll go to the manufacturer's website, see what they uh, say about it. Then I'll go on to eBay and Amazon and I'll look at other sellers' websites and see what they say about it. And I'll look at everything and I try to rewrite it the best I can and just, you know, do the product features and the description, the call to action everything and um, price is important I try to price it fairly but I always kind of felt that if I had all that other stuff that it would sell yeah it does yeah it's a lot of like copywriting and marketing that goes into it do you find any specific types of call to action that have worked best throughout the years well I try to make sure that after I've looked at the product and I like what I see that I do call it a deluxe or a premium, something like that, mm. so they know that it's not garbage. Mm-hmm. And then I try to let them know, like if it's a vacuum cleaner filter, that you need to change it every three to six months. Education. Make sure you stock up. Just real simple things. Yeah. And they seem to work. So what else works for you to boost sales that other people should be doing? We we sell on uh, multiple platforms. And, you know, I just try to offer the product in a one pack and I do a lot of bundles and kits. So I'll sell it in a a two pack, a four pack, an eight pack, Mm. give people a lot of choices. And then I'll put it in kits with, if it's a vacuum cleaner, you know, I'll sell the vacuum cleaner with uh, extra bags and extra parts. Mm. We're adding extra value and trying to keep it around the same price. And that seems to interest a lot of people. And it's really hard to pull the price out and for people mm, to yeah. really compare it. So it really it does seem to work. Yeah, the kit. So it's sort of like a one-stop shop for whatever their need is. Um, what have you found is a sweet spot for like two-pack, four-pack, eight-pack? What do people like to, to buy? 
Well, it's interesting. I saw a lot of vacuum cleaner bags. So you'll get these packages, you'll get these commercial cleaning companies that'll buy cases of bags where you'll sell them, you'll offer them like uh, 500 bags. So you have that kind of niche. And then you have just sort of the regular homeowner that just wants to get it really fast. So they'll just buy and just don't want to spend a lot of money. They'll buy just one pack. And then we kind of, usually there's a middle of the road person that'll mm. buy maybe four packages, maybe 20 to 40 bags total, something like that. So that seems to work really well. The 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 guy, there's not a lot in between. Have you, do nine. you also sell to the big companies like a 500 bag or whatever? Yeah, is? you'd yeah. be surprised how many big companies actually buy on eBay or Amazon. Hmm. Just, um, you'd be really surprised. Wow. So what about things to avoid? What mistakes should people avoid with their e-commerce business? Well, I do a lot of talking to my suppliers to try and find out what other people are selling. Yeah. I just ask a lot of questions. And um, so I'm really careful about what I buy and I'm really careful that I don't overbuy. Mm. And that's really important because I've had situations where I get, a, I think what is a great deal on something and I'll buy a thousand of it and I'll be looking at it two years later. Mm. And I might be looking at it in the dumpster two years later. Right. That's painful. Yeah. <laughs> that's money throwing out. Yeah. Yeah. That's a real pain. So what's some interesting things that your suppliers have told you throughout the years that have helped? They will, I've developed relationships with some of them to the point where they'll tell me things that maybe they shouldn't tell me about what's coming up, what a new product is, um, uh, what don't buy something because there's going to be a sale on it. Mm. Um, just building those relationships has helped. Mm. Um, has helped me a lot. They'll, they tell me things that are are very important and um, and save me money and make mm. me money. That's interesting. So relationships are huge. And so are there certain ways that you keep up with people like relationship wise or you have a process for that that you, okay, I'll call these people just to check in every so often or what do you do? That's exactly what I do. I will either call or email no more than 30 days out. Even if it's just, hey, just checking in on you. And they'll, most people use email and that's, they don't want to be bothered with a phone call. That's not a sale. <laughs> so I'll do email. Right. And for those who I know don't maybe check their email regularly enough, I'll give them a call and just say, hey, just check it up. Anything new I should know. Yeah. And it really, really helps. So what other, you've been doing this for almost nine years. Um, what other mistakes would you tell your old David self to avoid? Um, David gets a little um, shopping addicted sometimes. Okay. And uh, had to really calm that down. Um, you just just get sometimes so motivated to build up business that you think you have to bring in all this new product and new inventory and do it all at once. And then what ends up happening is you, you'll bring in 10 or 20 new products and then it'll take you 30 to 60 days to get them listed. So you have just essentially idle dollars sitting in your warehouse. Mm. That, that's a, it can, can get to basically be turning over inventory over. It kind of goes into that. You must turn over your inventory. Yeah. Critical. So tell me about the process a little bit. So they ship it to you, and then what happens? Well, the way it used to work 100% of the time was they would ship it to me. I would even, Sometimes it would just be a sample, but if I knew what it was, um, I would just bring in a whole batch of it, and then I would get it listed. And I really started out on eBay. That was my first foray into online retailing mm -hmm. and then I would just get up, I would take pictures and I would drop the listings, um, have a little familiarity with um, HTML. So I would write up my own listings and I would do the bundles and the kits and all that. And I would get it going. And then 
Um, I, initially, I used to do this when I first started. I was working out of my basement in my mm, house, right. and that was that was very difficult because I was bringing inventory uh, into my. I was getting UPS dropping it off on my driveway, or I'd go to a supplier and pick it up. And I'd have to be bringing cases of product, heavy product, down into my basement. Oh God! And then, and I was just. Um, I found really good. Um, software program initially to use to print labels and I was printing the labels and doing the orders and then dragging the merchandise upstairs and taking it outside to the front door and waiting for UPS and USPS to pick it up. Today I'm in a 3,000 square foot facility right. and so we just download the orders uh, of course using Scubana and manage everything with that and the orders come in, and it's really almost as simple as pressing print, and the labels print out, and then the order pours back and set up to go out. Yeah, I want to talk about Scubana, and because and, you can go with a lot of different software packages, and you've been doing this for a long time. And first, I want to go back to those those basement days. You know that most people start there. You know, mm -hmm. just getting it in their basement packing, shipping themselves, carrying heavy boxes. Um, but I want to back up one step in. So what were you doing before? I know we were talking and you worked for 17 years somewhere. What were you doing? I was working for a distributor of floor care supplies um, about 20 minutes from my house. And uh, I was a buyer for them, actually. Hmm. So I was very familiar with the floor care industry. I was buying a lot of items, vacuum cleaners. Uh, we were selling tons of vacuum cleaners and tons of parts. And I was just sitting behind a desk for all those years. And then one day, we, had, we sold, had some other product there. We had sewing machines and certain electronic items like cash registers and calculators and things like that. And we had a bunch of overstock and uh, we were just talking, like, how are we going to get rid of this? And there mm. was this platform called eBay. Right. And we thought, well, let's let's try that to move some of our stuff. And at that company, we started an eBay business. And we quickly realized, and this was probably 2001, maybe, that this was going to be a, a pretty good thing. Right. And we just started moving product out of there. And it was kind of touchy because we were a wholesale distributor, but then we were selling retail. Right. This was just a few years before it became kind of, kind of mainstream where pretty much every manufacturer sells directly to consumer and right. wholesaler does. But at that time, we really tried to protect it from other people knowing what was going on. Mm -hmm. But I was kind of overseeing that whole process. Yeah. So at what point do you decide... Because it's a tough decision. You're somewhere for 17 years. You decide, I'm going to strike out on my own. Well, the economy was starting to get a little shaky. 2005-ish um, in Michigan in particular, where we had a good stronghold there. And it was, it was a year or two before it really kind of took over the rest of the country. We saw it. We definitely saw it in business started to decline mm. and um, I had young children and um, I saw that my income was probably not going to be what it was and I needed another way I knew I was going to need another way to make money because I just didn't we had so many things going on at that company that I didn't have control of even though what I was doing was still doing pretty well I just didn't think that the company was yeah. going to be surviving company as a whole was you saw it going downhill I saw it going downhill, and I, I got I said I got to do something myself. Um, so I wanted to do something myself that wasn't in competition with my employer. And just by chance, by chance, we had gotten a, a dog, and we wanted to put up an electric fence. And a friend of mine told me, "Go to this company." And this is where you buy it. So I go and I buy the electric fence. And in the package, when I open it up, is a letter there saying, we're always 
we're always looking for dealers. Hmm. And if you're interested, give us a call. And I gave them a call and they told me how they operated, that they drop ship. And um, this was actually kind of new to me that a company was actually going out and soliciting and that you could actually make a profit on selling their items. Mm -hmm. And so I started just doing a little eBay myself with that, with my own store name. And then I paid somebody, I think I went on to like a, like elance.com, some, some website where you hire a freelance designer and they helped me make a website and we called it petstuff.com. Hmm. And we just, that's how I kind of started experimenting with Google ads and really kind of learning all that. So I was doing eBay and I was doing that. And so I saw for myself that, yeah, you can, you can make money online as a, just a single person trying to do it. I didn't need a whole company behind me. Did you build up the business before you left the previous company or what was that transition like? I had been building up my eBay business to the point where I had a really good amount of feedback which is cr really, really critical on eBay is getting your feedback, good reputation. Mm -hmm. So once I did that, I could probably sell anything. Mm. But you really want to go and you want to sell something that you can actually, you can buy at a, at a price that you can make money on it when you resell yeah. it. Yeah. So I had used some of my knowledge of the, real, you know, the suppliers that I had had so the other so the other business that I was working at business was really not doing well and I knew that I had I knew it was time to go. Yeah. And when it was time to go, I had already gotten this other stuff going and just really with the help of some people that I knew in the industry, one person told me to talk to somebody else and someone said talk to somebody else. The next thing you know, I'm doing all these listings on eBay for vacuum cleaner bags and filters and yeah. and Kirby chemicals and it's pretty random. So what what was the evolution of product that you sold? So you started off in pet stuff. Started right? off, yeah, and I, I start so I started selling pet supplies, and then from there um, I still did it for a while. Actually, right. I'm wondering went, why you're not still doing it because there's only so much time in a day. That's why. It's a it's a really good area to be in if you can focus on it. It's it's very very competitive. The margins are ultra slim, hmm. and uh, I had to make a choice at some point. Where do I want to spend my time? Do I yeah. want to spend it selling pet supplies, or do I want to spend it selling something that I actually have connections with? And that's mm -hmm. and that's the choice that I had made. Yeah. So you went from pets to then what was what were the next products that you introduced? Vacuum cleaner bags. Yeah. <laughs> and then with vacuum cleaner bags, I then started selling like this carpet shampoo, Kirby carpet shampoo, mm -hmm. because believe it or not, Kirby is probably the number one vacuum cleaner bag sold. Um, and a lot of the people that have Kirby vacuums, those vacuums are multi-use machines and you can use them to mm. clean your carpets a lot mm -hmm. of chemicals sold with that so mm -hmm. i would do bags i would do a gallon of chemical two packs of bags and a extra vacuum cleaner belt just a little little kit there mm -hmm. for people so what was next for products so i i, I was doing that and then um, just built that up as much as i could and then pretty much after a while, you got to start looking for other products. And I started a few years ago getting involved in air filtration products. So um, for air cleaners, like Honeywell air cleaners, Honeywell humidifiers, and other brands, right. and branched out into that. So now I do the, the whole mix. Yeah. David, how do you compete? Like, you know, obviously there's probably a lot of companies selling Kirby vacuum you know, vacuum bags and everything like that. How did you compete or how do you compete now? Well, as I said before, it's not always on price. It's a yeah. lot of it is on your reputation. It's on your content. 
it's on your pictures and then it's on your price and and advertising in the marketing also very helpful so I did all that and I probably have you know the 20, 80 20 rule probably 20 percent of the items make up 80 percent of the profit yeah. the other stuff I have to have but I'm really really careful when I buy stuff I look at the market and see where it's at and I'm not afraid to dis if there's no profit in it and mm. that kind of differentiates me from other people because a lot of people will just they want to be all things to all people they want to have the whole category and um, it's just not how I opted to do it yeah so what are the best sellers uh, for you what's the top 20 percent that you really focus on well, uh, air filtration is a huge issue all over. People talk about it all the time, especially this time of year when kids go up to school. They're bringing up air cleaners, and then in the, in the winter, there's just a lot of uh, humidifiers yeah. uh, sold. So all that stuff is really taking off and continues to grow. And we're I'm pretty close with a couple companies that – work with manufacturers in china and always looking for the next hot product mm -hmm. what's hot right now besides air filtration or air filters um we're also doing stuff um in coffee filtration coffee filters um also becoming really really big for us and we're just looking to keep adding there's a lot a lot of product out there that right. You know, you don't even realize until you just really do your research. Right. Yeah, that's what's interesting because there's so much you can do and sell even within a certain industry. What's your criteria for, okay, because you're doing all this research, okay, I'm going to move forward with this and start to, to try and sell this. The criteria is pretty simple. It's got to be something that retails, hopefully, I try to get my average retail at least – to twenty dollars you really want to be higher than that so you can make a you know some a little bit of money on the sale you want it to be light and you want a lot of demand and you want it to be good quality because you don't want it returned so I keep my returns very low try and keep that overhead low mm-hmm what works for you like you said to compete advertising and marketing is huge. What do you do that works as far as the marketing and advertising? Well, over the past couple of years, Amazon has been just really huge for us. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of learning the, been learning the ins and outs of it. It seems to change and always there seems to be a lot more people selling on it. So what do you do? So we've been doing a lot more of the Amazon advertising mm -hmm. within Amazon. Mm -hmm. And just drawing people to our the product that there's not tons of competition on, but we feel that there is demand for. Mm -hmm. And so we can we can be a little bit higher price on it because we're directing them right to our page where we're selling it. And we try to make sure that again the content is there, the pictures are there, and it's fair priced. And then they see our reputation. We have a 99% uh, satisfaction rating, which is really really high on amazon so uh, you're able to convince people that you know it's okay to buy from them it mm -hmm. may not be amazon but it is a legitimate company yeah so david what's the toughest part about the business probably the toughest part is just trying to stay efficient um, and just do things as efficiently as possible mm -hmm. process the orders as fast as possible and accurately as possible um, get the product here quickly and then get it back out the door real quick. Yeah. That's, that's a challenge. So tell me about, cause obviously you've put systems in place and software since your basement days. What kind of things do you have in place now? Well, I'll just tell you from the beginning, we did not have very good inventory management. The inventory management was right up here and then it went to kind of spreadsheets Mm -hmm. And that was really, really tough. And then we would we were doing 
like a cycle counting and yearly inventory just to make sure that everything was what it should be. But uh, it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible until I became familiar with Scubana, actually. Hmm. And that program has been just a huge factor over the last five, six months. It's really changed everything. It has simplified the whole process that we go through from ordering to inventory management to order processing, labeling, everything. It's been great. Yeah. I think it's important to talk about, I don't want to make this like a skew on a commercial or anything, but I right. think it's important to talk about within that some of the processes that it breaks down. So what, and obviously you probably looked at a variety of solutions before choosing one. What, what what systems does it have within it that everyone should look at, whether they use Skuban or anything? What does it do for you, essentially? It, it keeps track of my inventory as a whole. And then it communicates that information to the various platforms that I sell on. Mm -hmm. So if I have 100 of something, it tells all the other platforms that he has 100 for sale. Mm -hmm. And if I sell 10, it takes 10 off of all of them mm. pretty quickly. Yeah. So there's no overselling. Yeah. And that was a problem before. Really? Because overselling can be a can can be a problem because you don't want to disappoint your customers and you don't want to get a bad reputation from right. them. So that that is something that other pieces of software just didn't really do. And if they did do it, they didn't work as well mm -hmm. and they were too expensive. And I'm a kind of a small business, I would say, small to medium sized business now. And it, it really was uh, unaffordable yeah. before. So, and I don't know what you share as far as this goes, but to give people a sense, um, what volume or numbers can people kind of put on? What does that mean to you, like a small or medium sized business? Well, we're. Uh, I would just say this, we're a multi-million dollar company. We do something around 15,000 orders per month. Wow, that's that's wild. So, you know, from my basement. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> imagine you in your basement with 15,000 orders a month. Yeah. <laughs> That'd now be crazy. We, we do ship a lot of the product that comes in here and it goes to Amazon and they fulfill the orders. Yeah. But we still do a fair amount of orders That's right wild. through our warehouse here. Wow. So what have you seen the problems with overselling? Like before you had a system in place, what would happen? Well, the way that we avoided too many problems was that we always sold products that we knew we could get within a couple days mm, so that we wouldn't it. have to explain to our customers why we didn't have the product that we advertised. Mm -hmm. Um, initially, on eBay, you people expected you to have the product. If you advertised it, you should have had it. Right. Now, I think people understand that this goes on a little bit, but you definitely. So now it gives us the opportunity to maybe bring things in that you know that we don't have to worry about if we oversell. So that's one real good solution. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you had instances where you did oversell? Oh, yeah. What happened? <laughs> oh, we would have to uh, refund the customer or we would call the customer and see if they could wait. Um, then you would almost always get some type of a negative feedback from them, mm -hmm. which would affect your overall ability to sell. Right. And then you might have to contact them again and say, you know, we did refund your money right away. Can you please retract that? It was a, t it was a time it's waster. A pain. Yeah, it's just not a good way to do business. Yeah. So what platforms do you find work best? Because you're probably on a, a lot of different platforms, right? Well, yeah. Well, we're on um, eBay. And I do a little bit of order management for a couple other companies as well, processing. And then I do, we have our own website. And then we do Amazon. We do it fulfilled by merchant and fulfilled by Amazon. So we really can keep track of the inventory really tightly, where the merchandise is being stored and how much is being shipped and what our total inventory value is. Very important. What makes you s divide up 
like in your instead of sending like a lot to how do you decide how much to send to Amazon fulfillment, how much to keep in house? It was a lot of trial and error. Um, a lot of research goes into it. It took it took probably a year and a half of just selling fulfilled by merchant till I realized that I could sell it fulfilled by Amazon. Yeah. That was even possible. It seems like such a, a tough process to go through. You have to label product and you can't really screw it up and then you have to you have to put like small labels on the product and then just get everything exactly right it just seem a lot more than uh we could handle mm. and then we just we noticed how everybody some people their feedback ratings were just going up and up and up on amazon and they must have been selling so much more than us and how were they doing it mm. and just more research just took us to we have to try this right and then we did it, and um, we'd send maybe 20 of something, and then it would sell real fast, and then you went to 40, and then to 100, and then pretty soon you're sending um, 1,000. The numbers get pretty staggering. Right. And I think most people wouldn't realize the volume that gets sold by Amazon. It's, it wow. Is, it, it's remarkable. It, 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 it's, it's really eye-opening. So did you find the press to be easy? Because... Don't they label it and do things like those little things for you, or do you have to do certain things in house before you ship it to Amazon? The, the fees that they charge to do that are probably twice as much as it would cost me to do it. Got it. But every time that I would see them charging twenty cents to apply a label, I would say, "Well, a label costs me a, a half a cent, and the printing is maybe a half a cent. And if people are doing it efficiently here, we can do it for maybe a nickel." Instead right. of twenty cents, so right. that may be and the, over fifteen thousand orders. That makes a huge difference. It's a huge difference. Yeah, pretty soon they become real numbers. Right, right. So yeah. how many staff do you have to have? Well, we have. I have four uh, full time people here, and I have two part time people. Yeah, um, and then you deal with the normal things that you deal with: turnover, days off, vacations, sick days. All that kind of stuff. It makes that uh, twenty cents on Amazon not look so bad sometimes, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and I know we we're talking before we we hit record, which is most people in your in the area that you're in the um, I don't know, the industrial spaces, I guess, are kind of one and done. And you've been there, and you've expanded from one to to four. Um, mm -hmm. so what have you seen? I don't know if you, how much you talk to their businesses, but what have you seen? Why they're, they're just, they go out of business. They go out of business or they go back to their basement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, people, uh, tend to try things and not, they don't have that, uh, stick to itiveness yeah. and they just don't want to work hard yeah. in order to make their businesses succeed. Yeah. Tell me about that tenacity because up to this point, David, I'm like, okay, you know, there's a lot of competition for the vacuum bags. A lot of po people probably start in their basement putting it on eBay and Amazon, but you are succeeding and doing really well. And it's got to be something more than descriptions and pictures and, and things. So what else, what am I missing here? What else are you doing that is working? <laughs> I, I swear to you, it's just, it's just hard work. So tell me, what's just, a typical day like that most people would say, "Whoa, David, you're working really hard." Like, what does your your day look like? It's um at this point, it's a lot more mental labor yeah. than it is physical. Mm -hmm. But it was a lot of physical at first. I mean, my day starts out probably six thirty in the morning with a cup of coffee in the Wall Street Journal, you know, letting the dogs out, and then right after that, I'm uh, off to my office or I've got the computer up at home. And I'm going through all the orders. I'm I'm actually looking at all the messages, mm -hmm. and I have people to do that. But I want to stay on top of that. I want to know what people are asking about, right. and so I read them. I I don't answer them, but I read them. You just keep your pulse on things. I'm just wondering what you're doing. Like you picture Michael Jordan, you know how he's so good. Well. Maybe after everyone's done with practice, he'd take like 100 free throws or something. So I'm wondering, what are you doing that people are not seeing you know, behind the scenes? 
Well, you know that thing about the 10,000 hours? Yeah. If you do something 10,000 hours? Yeah. That's kind of uh, where I'm at. I've just been doing this so long. I know what to look for. Um, I know when to stop selling a product. Mm -hmm. I know when to look at products and uh, look, lower my price to get rid of them. Um, just try and stay liquid as possible so that I'm, I can pay my bills. And that's, an, that's another thing too, by the way, is all the vendors that I deal with, I always stay within my terms. I've, I don't think I've ever been late for a single payment. And despite the fact that I may not be their biggest customer, I'm probably their best paying customer. And they always remember that. And so if you talk to them and stay in touch with them, you will get the benefit of some of the good deals and the opportunities to make more money. So I just, I, I really do. I just stay on top of what I do. Um, I definitely don't think I'm the smartest. I don't think I'm buying everything at the lowest price, but I That's think it's That's the first time I've heard a Michigan graduate say they're not the smartest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll show my wife this. No. Yeah. Well, you know, I still, I always try to impress people, but when they ask me my background and I tell them I graduated from U of M business school, right. they can think I'm really smart, but <laughs> you know, so I just... What keeps yeah. you up at night now? I mean, things that are pretty automated. You've been doing this for nine years almost. Well, besides the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Not including dogs, yeah. Um, I just always think about um, how I can make the infrastructure of my business better. Mm -hmm. Because there's got to be an, an end game at some point. Mm -hmm. As you get older, you want to make sure you have the business really built up. And to the point where it'll be interesting to somebody else. Yeah, uh, I'm not ready to to be done by any stretch, but I think that you want to think about that and think about how you can build the business up so that that one day you can uh, you can pass it on to somebody else. I don't think my kids want it, so I do think about okay, well, what am right. I going to do? Once they get uh, so that all the processes are working. Right. So. That's a good point, David. What infrastructure do you have in place now that you think is really essential? And then what do you think is the next level for you? Well, I think the most, I think it's really important to have good people. Yeah. And I think I'm at that point where I have really good people. And just I, the process now with the inventory management has really improved. And then, of course, keeping good product here and then keeping good relationships with my vendors. So mm -hmm. if I have all that, I think that um, I'll continue to do well. So anything in the future that you're looking at as far as infrastructure that you think will you know, make things even better? Or do you think you're at a point now that you have things kind of not coasting, but, but you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I'm definitely not coasting. Um, I think there's a point where because of the way the business is physically set up that, that I'm going to want to maybe go to just one larger building. Mm. So maybe I can be a little more efficient mm. with maybe the uh, utilities. I see. Because um, you're in four separate and, spots. Yeah, they're all connected. Yeah. And we keep the prime product as close to the packing area as possible. We are fairly efficient in that way. Um, and maybe there may not be as efficient to do that because maybe it's just going to be too costly to to move and too costly to go into a more modern facility. Mm -hmm. This is not, not modern, but it's definitely not, you know, an A-plus building. So how do you decide that? That's for sure. Yeah, how do you decide when or if to even do that? Well, I've been, you know, I've all, I've been thinking about it. We've been really kind of bursting at the seams recently. And so that makes you think, well, you know, you should maybe keep your eyes open for a good location. And I have to look in my lease, I think is uh, up really, really soon. So it's probably not a bad time to start looking at it, but it's kind of a nightmare to actually, actually do the move physical everything. part of the move. Yeah. You know, the. You probably yeah, the, have so much tied to 
the address and the shipping and everything it'd be kind of like a logistical headache <laughs> that you don't want to deal with what other systems or software like is there customer service software or other things that you're using in your business that'd be helpful to mention we um we use um for our amazon we use a repricing tool which um i don't know if you're familiar with that but that's been something that's been important mm -hmm. to help maximize our sale price and profitability mm -hmm. um, and then we also use uh, software that does um, request feedback from our customers if mm -hmm. they haven't provided feedback mm -hmm. and uh, again with Amazon and eBay the higher your uh, satisfaction level is the more business you're gonna do right so we, we keep those numbers like I said earlier 99% and it just really, really helps. We, we have an advantage over those that are less than that in terms of search relevance. Uh, very, very important. Yeah. So what do you use? What, um, what software? We use a program called Feedvisor mm -hmm. for our repricing tool. Mm -hmm. And then for our feedback, uh, we use Feedback 5. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, there's other companies out there, but those have been really good for us. Yeah. So David, you know, this has been, I love hearing the journey, you know, from the basement to the four warehouses. Um, since it's this Hubana e-commerce mastery series, my question is, what are some of the best tips? We talked about a lot of things. What are some of the best tips that people can take action on now to increase their e-commerce business? What should we leave them with? Well, the, Probably the most important thing is part of your question, which is what do they need to do to take action? And the, you have to take action. Mm -hmm. You actually have to do it. You have to go ahead and you have to try it. If, if there's a product that you want to try because you think it might be good, I think you ought to try it. Uh, don't bet your uh, life savings on it, but try it. And just think about what your liquidation price would be before you do it. Right. And that's what I always do. And can you afford the loss? So that's one thing that I do. Um, uh, ask a lot of questions. I simply ask my suppliers, are other people buying this? Mm. And that that's a great question. You get a lot of, get a lot of feedback from your suppliers. Um, and then just any risk that you take, just make sure it's calculated. Just, you know, don't, don't take out a year lease on a building if you're not sure you, you can make it. You know, do a month to month and pay attention to your business. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, the suppliers are the ones selling to all these people. You might as well just ask them what are the best sellers and what are other people buying that would be good. David, where should people check you out? What uh, what site should we send them to? You, should, you can check me out at uh, merchandisemecca.com. It's merchandisemecca.com. And then you can check out our store on eBay, which is Merchandise Mecca, and um, also on Amazon. If you just type in Merchandise Mecca, you'll find, in the search bar, you'll find our, our products. Yeah. Why do you think, you know what I find interesting, David? Why do you think that other vacuum cleaner, people selling vacuum parts online, are just giving each other advice, and there's not like a cutthroat nature to it? Uh, well, don't don't believe that there's not a cutthroat nature because okay. there is somewhat. Okay. Uh, but there's some really good guys out there um, who realize that the market is huge yeah. and they're not going to get 100% of the business. And so they just don't worry about it. Yeah. And they're they're getting their own and and there's actually some good – actually there's some really good people out there. Yeah. There really are. So it's it's very interesting. Um, as far as that goes. So I want to be the first one to thank you, David, so much. You know, this is probably as much out there on the internet of you probably that there ever will be, maybe. So <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks very much for having yeah. me. Thank you. Okay, take care. <laughs>